Hey everyone, I want to talk today about Master Limited Partnerships and K1s. As you all know, I own Cedar Fair, ticker symbol F-U-N. I own this Master Limited Partnership. I started buying it in 2018 and it's already a top 15 favorite dividend stock for me. It's yielding 7% and they just grew the distribution by 4%, so it's really encouraging to see that growth rate on top of an already high yield. That being said, these master limited partnerships and the K1s that accompany them have been very confusing for a lot of investors in the community. And honestly, I've been learning as I go as well. I kind of jumped right into this and I figured, look, I've done K1s before and I'll learn as I go with Cedar Fair. And I want to share with you today the lessons that I have learned so far and how K1s work if you're thinking about investing in master limited partnerships. So let's get started. All right, everyone, so I want to jump right into it. But before that, if you've been following my videos, I am still sick. In fact, I have a really bad case of the flu. If you caught my last video, I was already sick in that one, and it just has been taking a very long time to get better. So I'm basically bedridden these days, but I wanted to take a quick moment to film this video take a break, um, maybe make things a little bit more interesting in my otherwise boring routine here where I'm literally stuck in my bed. So let's talk about master limited partnerships. The first thing that I wanna talk about are distributions. And so when one receives a quarterly dividend from a master limited partnership, it is not a typical qualified dividend as with most of the other stocks I cover here on PPC Ian. It is actually a distribution. And so these distributions from master limited partnerships are actually considered a return of capital. So literally, let's say I put $100 into a master limited partnership and I got a $10 distribution. They're returning $10 of my capital and then my cost basis adjusts downward accordingly. And so it's a return of capital. We'll get more into cost basis later, but the interesting thing to keep aware of here is a return of capital from a master limited partnership is not taxed. I repeat, this is a non-taxable event. So return of capital, it's not tax these distributions. And so I don't provide tax advice here, but I do want to share my personal insights and lessons. So I do highly, highly encourage everyone to consult a licensed tax advisor before investing. But these are the things that I've picked up so far investing in Cedar Fair and um, learning about master limited partnerships. Now, one thing to keep in mind is pass through entity. Master limited partnerships, they're, they're basically partners of uh, partnerships and there's um, general partners, limited partners, they're publicly traded and I'm a limited partner. I own partnership units in the Cedar Fair uh, partnership structure and um, it's a pass through entity. So what happens is at the corporate level, this is an amusement park company, all of the money that they earn they don't pay taxes at the corporate level. What they do is they pass that through. They pass it through to the partners like myself, and then um, partners will receive a K-1 each year. This is a tax form, and on the tax form, it will show, hey, what is your share of the profits? It's all on a percentage basis based on what percentage of the company each partner owns, and based on the partner's percentage, percentage ownership, that partner is responsible for taxes. Now, one thing that's really important is there are kind of two concepts when it comes to master limited partnerships, and especially Cedar Fair being in a uh, real estate centric space, they will pass through not only income, net income, but also depreciation. And this is really the benefit, in my opinion, of this structure. It is really tax efficient, in my opinion, for the right investors in the right circumstances. But with Cedar Fair, for example, the company on the K-1 that I received lost money. They lost money in 2018, meaning not only did I receive my distributions um, that I will not be taxed on because they're return of capital, but what happened is I also got a share of the company's loss in 2018, meaning I can write that off against other income on my tax return. Now, 
Are they really losing money? No, I will link in the description below to a video I did on Cedar Fair with a very detailed analysis. There's this concept in real estate of depreciation. And what happens at a company like Cedar Fair is they put in place all of these roller coasters. They also own hotels and they own businesses that operate both in and out of the parks. They own hotels that are literally right next to their theme parks. And what happens is these assets, the tax code allows them to depreciate it over time. And the uh, it, are these hotels really losing value? Are these roller coasters really losing value at the clip at which they are allowed to be depreciated for tax purposes? No, and so what happens is this depreciation cancels out income and what it allows Cedar Fair to do from a tax purpose is pass losses through to the partners and these losses can be very valuable again because they can be advantageous for tax purposes and can if if they break even there's no taxes for the partners that year and if they lose money those losses can be used against the partners other income on their personal tax returns so really cool stuff now a subscriber asked me hey what about capital expenditures and capital expenditure, for those that don't know, is hotels, roller coasters. Some of this depreciation, it's kind of, it's real. It's real in the sense that roller coasters need to be maintained. Hotels need to be maintained. They need to be remodeled from time to time. Rooms get uh, used and they need to have new carpet. The, the plumbing needs to be maintained. All that kind of stuff. And so... Yes, there are capital um, expenditures at this company. And when I did my analysis, I'll actually link in the description below my spreadsheet. You'll see that in there. The depreciation that they're facing, though, far surpasses CapEx. And so depreciation, again, it's a very exciting concept and it can reward real estate investors quite a bit. And this is not just for Cedar Fair. This is a concept that applies to real estate in general. And so if you are interested in getting into real estate, investing in real estate, I do recommend that you research that concept. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, he speaks of depreciation quite a bit as well. And it's really a um, powerful concept. So moving on, and by the way, I don't expect Cedar Fair to have a loss every year. Being realistic, and at certain points in the future, I do expect that the depreciation will not outpace their income, and so there will be a tax liability. I will have to pay my percentage of the income that they earn that year on um, that comes through on my K-1. And so that's just something that has to be weighed when one invest in master limited partnership, some years might be like this, but not all. And so yeah, there's no taxes on the distributions, but on the income that rolls through, yeah, that's gonna be taxed and net net, some years the tax burden may be higher than others as we're seeing here with Cedar Fair. So one concept that is really important with master limited partnerships is to keep track of the cost basis. And so cost basis literally goes down over time and the cost basis goes down because of the return of capital, the distributions, but also the depreciation that flows through. So my cost basis in 2018 alone got a big haircut because like Cedar Fair had a great year for me. I got a bunch of distributions and I got a net a loss because of their depreciation. And so I have to adjust my cost basis downward. Now, this doesn't affect me too much because I buy and hold forever. And so it certainly affects people who might want to buy something like this and then sell it in the future because if the cost basis goes down at time of sale, the capital gains are bigger because cost basis going down and the capital gains are paid on the gap, the difference between the sale price and the cost basis. And so this is a concept very unique to master limited partnerships that cost basis is going down over time. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if the cost basis does reach zero, which it will at some point, what happens is all future distributions are taxed as ordinary income. And so they're taxed at the higher rate. And so this is a unique dynamic with these companies as well as in the short term for say the first 10, 15 or so years that someone owns a company like this, it's really, in my opinion, fruitful from a tax perspective, but looking further out, looking out into the future, it, there may be a point where then the uh, consequences, the tax consequences 
are not so favorable because the cost basis reached zero and all of those distributions start um, getting taxed as ordinary income. Now, thankfully, what I'll tell you on cost basis is the K-1 I received, the whole K-1 package I received from Cedar Fair, it was really well thought through. I was really pleased with it, and it actually helps me track my cost basis the way that they've done everything. And so it gave me the confidence, actually, to buy in snut really small lots but smaller lots smaller tranches and so i actually just bought some more cedar fair yesterday and um, i'm going to continue to average into this one over the course of 2019 i really really like this stock i like how it provides diversification for me into the amusement park industry i like how it is set up from a tax perspective and i love the um the yield it's just an awesome company i like that it's a smaller company too it's a nice uh, small cap that i own now, one thing to be very, 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 very careful, and so I want to underscore this because I've, saw, I've seen some chatter in the community, hey, I own Master Limited Partnerships in my retirement account. If you are considering doing this, please, please research it, talk to an expert, pay for advice, go, go straight to the experts who have the uh, degrees, they have the credentials to advise you on this. And the reason I say this is I was doing some research online and for an IRA at least, including something like this in an IRA, someone logically may think, hey, I'm just gonna include it in the IRA because then if in the years where there, there's not so much depreciation, there's a lot of income, I don't have to pay, um, I don't have to pay the taxes because it's in the IRA. That is not true. And so, what I was researching online is actually this is not well suited for an IRA. It may go against the rules of certain IRAs. And it may in fact put an IRA into a weird situation where it may have to file additional paperwork. And if the distributions get high enough, I think it was saying over a thousand a year, the um, IRA may have to pay taxes on this holding, basically it may totally mess up an IRA. And so I own my Cedar Fair in a taxable account, normal brokerage taxable account. And that is the kind of structure that is typically well suited to take advantage of an investment like this. And so if you do own it in a different form, such as an IRA or a retirement account, please go out. I'm not an expert on this, but from what I've read, it's really weird. It can be, uh, it's, it's important there to be extremely, extremely cautious, not only for Cedar Fair, but any master limited partnership for, for that matter. So one final closing point I'd like to say today is just on K-1s. They can involve more work. I already have K-1s coming in, so I'm used to dealing with them. I have a process in place. My tax advisor is used to handling them, but processing K-1s, there's a fee. It costs money to process K-1s. And so my strategy on all this is if I'm going to introduce this kind of complexity into my life, I'm gonna own a master limited partnership, it's gonna create more complexity for me. If I am going to do that, I better own a big chunk of it, I better really love it. And so for me, I own 40 dividend stocks. And um, of the 40, this is in my top 15 and I'm adding to it aggressively because I want it to provide a big chunk of income for me to really make it worth the hassle of all this, because it is a lot of hassle. Just all of this, all of this stuff that's going on, it's a lot of record keeping, it's a lot of hassle, and so I love it, I love these details, but for it to work for, I mean, I think it's a very elegant solution, and it provides a lot of value for investors from a um, tax standpoint, especially in the short run, which is great, because what if I do need my short-term income? I always um, can tap into my Cedar Fair. But anyways, for that extra headache, I uh, better be um, having a big enough position. And so if I were a really small investor and let's say I was just going to put um, maybe 1000 or a few thousand dollars into this, I probably would not do that because it wouldn't be worth the headache to me to um, go through all of the paperwork and record keeping. I'd rather just stick with my qualified dividends unless I was going to go a lot bigger with um, something like this. But again, just my personal opinion here, just sharing my personal journey. I will link in the description below by the way, to another video I did about taxes. I think you'll find that interesting. It doesn't talk about MLPs, but it talks about taxes on dividend stocks in general. And I will link in the description below as well to my original Cedar Fair video, the really in-depth analysis where you can download my spreadsheet and see um, in more detail what I'm talking about here from a numbers standpoint, from a um, 
distribution standpoint, from a cash flow standpoint. Before I leave, one thing I do want to clarify is everyone's always saying, I see in the comments all the time, hey, Ian, I look at this coming and the payout ratio is no good. Again, the, pay, the reason the distribution is higher than the earnings per share is earnings per share is post depreciation. It's on a gap standpoint and gap earnings per share takes depreciation into account. And again, depreciation, it's not, it's not in my opinion, a, a, a real thing because they're accounting for capital expenditures in the model as it is. And so what I'm saying is cash flow, funds from operations, this needs to be analyzed more like a real estate investment trust on a cash flow basis. That's how I look at it because the gap earnings per share, they're totally skewed. And it, yeah, it looks like they have a huge payout ratio, but it, because it's because of the enormous depreciation. That's why I like this model so much, quite frankly, is because it provides a lot of depreciation that is passed through to the partners like myself, which is really cool. Before I leave today, in terms of full disclosure, I am Long Cedar Fair, ticker symbol F-U-N. In terms of a disclaimer, today's video is not investment advice. I'm not a licensed investment advisor. Today's video is just for your fun and entertainment. If you're going to go out and invest in the stock market or anywhere else, please consult a licensed financial advisor first. Literally just sharing my journey here on YouTube for fun and entertainment. Also, today's video is not tax advice. I'm not a licensed tax advisor. Before going out and making decisions that affect your, may or may not affect your taxes, please consult your licensed tax advisor first. That's very, very important, especially given the complexities of this stuff, which is super complex. All right, everyone, I'll see you in the next one.